happy one, um, mm. except again, like it seemed in the water with us that that was sort of something that we all shared. And, um, you know, so, so I have a sort of like nostalgia, a sort of sentimentality for that. Well, it, it seems like it brings you back. Like now even you continue to swim and it's this way to connect to a happier place or a place to, that, that brings feeling feelings of warmth maybe or feelings that mm -hmm. things were, were good. I imagine like, yeah, although, um, I would say I would, to be honest, my life has been filled with so many other moments of, um, you know, like water related happiness that like <laughs> that is, that's the beginning of it, but that, but that's not all of it. And that's certainly not the thing that's present in my mind on a daily basis. But you know, when I do, you know, my father lives in Southern China. Yeah, um, he moved back, moms. correct? Yeah, he did. And then my mom is um, still in New York. And you know, especially in these times when I just, we haven't been able to see each other very easily. And, um, and God knows when the next time I'm going to be back in China visiting my dad, like, yeah. it's just, I don't even know. <sighs> it's going to be years, years more, you know, but I think of you know, some of the trips we made and, um, you know, one, one particular trip when I went, I had a, uh, a store, an assignment to go to Hainan Island, which is the Chinese Hawaii, right? I, and then he, <laughs> I want to go there so bad. Like I went surfing there. It's so weird. The waves look sick, <laughs> like sick little They're point really breaks, nice. <laughs> but it's weird, um, right? It was like, so weird. And my father came to meet me there because I was like, you always wanted to go there. You, he, 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 he would tell me about it when I was good. He's like, oh, there's one place that's like the only like tropical or subtropical place in China. And I was like, guess what? I have to go for work. Do you want to come? And so we met there. And it was it was so strange because it was in the beginning of this boom there where there were a lot of resorts that were being built. Now it's like crazy. I mean, yeah. it's like unreal. It's a totally transformed um a landscape but it was when i went there it was still like a little bit it was still developing and so there were some gritty bits and you know construction everywhere but it was beautiful i mean the beach you know and then you'd have and it was like the beginning of uh, a culture of beach, beach going for the chinese that was not normal for them yeah. you know everyone in china mostly people avoid the sun you know it's like having very pale skin is very um, See, sought you know. after yeah and so yeah. like you would see these um couples in matching like aloha wear <laughs> and so they'd be like splashing around and you know at the what they didn't quite understand like how to get into the water or how to like be at the beach because they were totally covered up and they would have these like you know aloha shirts aloha shorts everything just patterns matching bucket hats sunscreen up the wazoo and it was like you know, we're on vacation, you know, it was like a new kind of vacationing. <laughs> Talk about adventure travel. That was like their, That's... it was really interesting to witness that for sure. I, I'm curious how surf culture will, will develop over there, to be honest. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. curious how the individualism that, that surfing tends to, to, to bring will, will work mm -hmm. in a, a country that tends to be more collective in how they, they do things you know it's right uh, right um i'm curious like uh, how that'll that'll be looked upon you know it was still like when i went surfing there i mean there was this expat who had kind of like set up shop there you know and he australian would... no i think he was he was not australian i think he was from california i'm uh -huh. trying to remember now but um you know he was his was like the only place where you could rent boards and um but it was like very new and um you know funnily enough i see a lot of um in the pandemic i've seen a lot of uh local chinese here in california in the bay area um they seem to be um well they speak mandarin and they seem to be like chinese china chinese um mm -hmm. and uh are starting you know has starting to surf. like surf and like trying to surf with like you know foam boards um and it was so interesting to me because i'm kind of like oh like there is definitely like a population yeah. um here in the bay area that i mean like so many people took took up surfing in the pandemic obviously yes. <laughs> but um it was interesting to observe that um 
like a particular group because I had not noticed, you know, first of all, like just people were coming out of the woodwork all over, like just, you know, wanting to learn how to surf. And so I was, I was watching, I've been watching, you know, certain people with interest, like, oh, like, well, I wonder what their story is. Um, You know, like if they're like grad students or if they're like people who, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I like, I love to, to kind of like watch and kind of absorb like how, how it's, the break is changing, you know? Well, it's, it's interesting with like, there's, there's this guy, Nick uh, Zanella, I think it is. Um, okay. He's a um, anthropologist, cultural anthropologist, and he's been studying mm-hmm. and touring uh, China and exploring mm-hmm. surf spots. But he found evidence that surfing had actually formed in China, you know, almost like a thousand years ago. And oh, there's, interesting. Yeah, there's like history of surfing and people riding waves. I mean, it what? it doesn't look like maybe <laughs> Hawaiian, but there is a history at surfing had had at some point, you know, people riding waves on on some sort of plank or something. You know, I don't know if they were uh-huh. standing, but it it's do you know there. where it was. Where I did, where I don't know. I have to I have to do more research. Like I'm really curious about about it. And there's this guy. His Instagram. He's touring China, and he's like, "Yep." Another empty point break with me and a few friends. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, I need to go to China and surf. Oh, I can't say it's anything negative game. about there yeah, now. It's, it's, the, it's the new frontier, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I have to check out this guy's Instagram. That's yeah, so I'll send it to you, you know. But it's okay. it's super interesting. Um, but getting back, like, this book then, it feels like it's been in the making for you for a while. Because mm-hmm. I remember you had written a piece on the AMA in in blue, actually, or were. Did I? Yeah, I guess maybe I did. I'm oh, pretty yeah, sure. Okay. I think I even have the. <laughs> I think I have it here. So, um, no and way. I yeah, like I remember seeing the photos, and Danielle had been working like on the you know, and Krista had been working on the design and everything. Uh, um, yeah. So I just I feel like there's. There's been like seeds of this for you, I guess, mm, for some yeah, time. For sure. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, one, can you describe w- what the AMA were uh, or mm-hmm. are in you know for yes. our listeners? Because it's so beautiful. Like the photos, it I is remember. Really beautiful. It's amazing. Well, so um, they're the you know the the divers, the the female divers, and. Uh, Japan, uh, and, uh, and then also, of course, in Korea, where, um, you know, it's, it's, they dive for shellfish and, you know, sort of subsistence um, fishing, but also, you know, there's like, um, you know, some of the groups would dive, I think they would dive for pearls. And so they would, um, uh, there was a culture of like free diving, and it was only women. And they, um, you know, it would be like, grandmothers you know people who are diving until their 80s maybe even 90s and um they would be in cold water and they'd have like a very particular ritualized kind of existence and i actually just read um uh, lisa c's book the island of sea women um it's it's wonderful it's about the culture of like the diving women um and it's it but that that book takes place in korea Um, and it's so, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I mean, it's so like meticulously researched. Um, and, uh, it's like, I had to write, I had to include that of course in in the book because it was, and I, and the context that I included in, in why we swim is, um, sort of from a scientific standpoint and from a physiological standpoint, like what were the, are there body changes? Like, are there, how, what does a lifetime of exposure to cold water do to you, f- f- like positively and negatively? And so I talked to these longevity scientists and um, about who uh, this Japanese um, uh, scientist who had uh, done a survey of um, uh, AMA in in a particular community in Japan, and he said, you know, they have like amazing cardiovascular health, right? So like if you when you go into water and you hold your breath like you know you just have really um you know you're used to your body is used to withstanding the pressure and your circulation and like your um you know your 
you know, at the time of your, when you're swimming, like the, the, your blood pressure will go up, but over time it's like your blood pressure goes down because your, um, arterial elasticity is like really powerful. Your heart is really strong, but then they also had terrible hearing because of like yeah. the, the cold water decades of Surfer's that exposure. Ear. <laughs> yeah. They can't like, you know, they're like, was it exostosis? Like yeah. their, their, their bones have like closed. And so they can't hear. <laughs> Uh, but you know, otherwise they like are in really good health. <laughs> Was that, um, wasn't it like they had enlarged spleens or gallbladder? Oh, like, well, so also? that was um, a different population different. of 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 people in Southeast Asia. So these are like the um, uh, like sea nomads um, in Southeast Asia, the Bajau and the Moken. So they're they're the um, they would live on. Um, uh, rafts or houseboats, and so they grew. You know, the the they were subsistence fishermen, basically free divers too. Wow. Like they would stay underwater for like so many minutes, and and kind of like when you get down deep enough, you're negatively buoyant. So they'd be like walking on the bottom, like spearing fish and collecting sh- you know shellfish and all that. Um, and they found um, actually it was like right. I remember this. It was like right when I had I had I had included a passage about and some research about how the Moken um, kids like could see underwater so much better yeah. than you know because they had been like trained from a very young age to like their you know the, cor- the human cornea is like it's it's not a good shape for like seeing you see very blurry underwater yeah um, because of the way um, you know light is refracted and and then but with like a bunch of training um, kids, uh, well, well, the Moken kids would grow up like, you know, doing this habitually. So they had really good underwater vision. And so what they wanted to know was like, is this something that can be acquired like through some, you know, practice. And so they had, you know, non Moken kids. Um, I think they had like some European kids who were like vacationing in the area. And so they did like, like a, maybe 12 sessions of like contrast, um, training in a pool. And then they also could see, really really well so it was like that was something that you could actually train yourself to do but the whole spleen thing that's a whole other thing where (laughs) like with the baja people it's unreal like so you know you can hear i'm like so excited to talk about it because it's like so (laughs) me too like just when i was listening to this when i was reading this i was just like this shit is fucking awesome like (laughs) holy crap like like I couldn't believe like the amount of research uh, that you were able to put into this book and the level of detailed information you're able to find. And it's so fascinating to me that what the human body can do and how it yes, can be ad- adapted. what it's capable of even now. Like, I think that that's what's cool, right? So like yeah. with the, the vision thing, like that we can still be trained, you know, yeah. to some level to adapt to our surroundings and to the and sort of readapt to the water from which we all came, and the thing with the spleens I love um, because that's like um, so a separate population of of sea nomads um, in Southeast Asia, the Bajo, like they were found to have like like much larger spleens than um, most most of us, and also like they compared with like a sort of land dwelling um, uh, population. Of, I think it was Bajau, but they were not, um, it was like they were, they also had like large spleen. So it was like, even though they had never, um, you know, done the free diving or whatever, like they were just genetically selected to like have large spleens, which then means that when you're diving, you, ha- it's like having like an extra tank of air, like, you know, like crazy. a scoop. Like, <laughs> so you just have like so much more. Um, you know, red blood cells circulating around in your system. Um, so that was so cool. Like, it's like, oh, even if you've never touched the water as a Bajo, like, like th- these Natural people divers. have evolved over time. Yeah, to be better at diving because that was like something that helped them to survive this place. I, I just find so it cool. fascinating how the body can adapt. And, you know, it's mm-hmm. interesting, like I finished reading your book and then I, I was I'm a jury member in the London Surf Film Festival and one of the books one of the movies I just watched was called uh, Big Vers Small and it's about this mm-hmm. woman Joana Andrade who is the first Portuguese mm-hmm. female to surf Nazare 
and mm. the